Chad, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. I'm so thrilled that you're here with us today. How are you? Melissa, I'm great. It's wonderful to be here with you. Thank you for having me. It's such a such an honor to be your guest. Well, Chad, I got to tell you, you're a smart guy. And I know we're going to have a lot of fun and we're going to cover some amazing topics. So if it's okay with you, I just want to jump into it. Yeah, please. Let's do so I have a copy of this book called Break and Untangle. Now, if you're listening to the podcast, you can't see me holding up the book and peeking around the side of it. But if you want to get a visual, jump over to YouTube at Melissa Ebkin, and you can see this interview. But Chad, you wrote this book. There's a lot of fantastic stuff in it. We're not going to get to cover every single page, though I would like to. But what else do you do? Uh, well, I'm glad that you have the book. That makes me very, very happy. I'm, I am one of those people that I really like a page turning book. I, I've tried to get into e-readers, but the fact that you have the paper in your hand and you can write on it and highlight it, it makes me, makes me so happy to see you with that. Um, and to shove a bunch of bookmarks inside yes, of it. Yes. And and, and dog ear the, the pages. I, I just love it. I would never, never. I would never. I would never accuse you of that. Um, <laughs> but I, I hope that you do. I, so I wrote the book. So I'm an author, um, I, I suppose, as a result of that. And I do some speaking. And I am a coaching curriculum developer, which means that I write the, uh, the curriculums for coaches to to train from. And, and so if, if a life or business coach is looking for a curriculum or a method from which to train or coach their uh, clients, I'm the person that writes those methods and curriculums. You're the guy. Excellent. That's right. So, all right, anyone listening, if you want to be a coach, call Chad. That's right. Chad will hook you up. Ring, ring. So, Chad, we are on a podcast called Pursuing Uncomfortable. You have not had an easy journey to this point. You didn't just wake up and were bestowed with these gifts and these talents and these abilities and the wisdom for the curriculum. Although I haven't asked you this question before, maybe you did, but I do know that it has been a journey for you. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey you've had? Yeah, of course. I, I have earned my stripes. I have, I have been through the ringer. I grew up a, a gay kid in rural Arkansas, and I most I'm not sure how much time you've spent in rural Arkansas, but enough it's not, to know that that would not be an easy life. It would yeah, be a very not easy, life. not exactly a gay utopia there in rural Arkansas. I actually did not meet my first openly gay person until I was in college. I went to the oh. University of Arkansas, which is about 45 minutes away from where I grew up, and that is where I met my first openly gay man. And um, so I grew up without a whole lot of, without any representation, without seeing anybody like me. I grew up in a, what I would only characterize as a, a Christian fundamentalist environment. Mm -hmm. We were missionary Baptist, um, uh, very rooted in, in Calvinist um, doctrine and, um, my the the pastor of the little church that I grew up in, which is mostly family, by the way, it was church services were almost always less than 20 people. Uh, I was there on Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday evenings. And our pastor also had a prison ministry. And I can remember as a little kid listening to him talk about the prison ministry. And he would talk about the redemption of uh, people that have done some really, really horrible things in their life. And the their redemption stories, but I never heard a redemption story about someone who was gay. That was like the ultimate, the ultimate, ultimate sin. And I grew up with that fear um, and lived with the consequences of that. I would say even still today, uh, with some internalized homophobia issues. Um, 
And so that was, that's how I grew up er around faith. That was certainly an uncomfortable situation. My dad was uh, a sadist. And so I had a whole lot of emotional and physical abuse growing up. And that, that's how I came into the world and how my lens and, and frame of perspective of the world was developed was, was through that, through that lens. Chad, as you know, I'm a pastor. We've talked about this previously. Yep. Also released today is a bonus episode of the podcast that has a view of the Bible. I don't believe that we have to look for a secret passage that allows for the inclusion of all people. I think the Bible from cover to cover proclaims a story of redemption of all people. And if you're interested in how I get to that understanding, then tune into the bonus episode because we're going to go through it all. If you have any questions, any comments, respond to that, and I would be happy to take those questions there. But that said, Chad, on behalf of all that you have suffered at the hands of people who are supposed to love you unconditionally, I offer a deep apology. That's not a good representation of the Christian faith. It's not a representation of a gospel that's supposed to love and redeem. That said. That's very kind. And I, and I, I take that to heart. I, I appreciate that. But what wasn't lost on me is that you said that your church experience was mostly family. So this was coming not just from a group of people that you could write off, but this was coming from your people, your tribe. Right. Yeah, that makes it especially difficult when the people that are supposed to love you the most um, don't or have conditions around that. Um, that's extremely unsettling and creates an enormous amount of uncertainty and makes it very hard as an adult to trust other people and trust connection and trust love. Uh, I, I had to completely redefine and work on and, ex and experience a lot of just redefining how I look at love and belonging and connection and spirituality has all um, had to be redefined for me because of the, what I would, I would consider a sort of a perverted expression of that growing up. Mm. So when did the healing begin for you? I would say the healing began. Well, there was this, there was this phase of my life where I was just surviving. Like that's all I knew. Surviving my my abusive dad meant staying small all the time, staying off his, of his radar, going unnoticed at home as much as possible. And so I learned to to be really, really small and quiet in the world. And that was part of the survival, learning how to survive. Also learning how to survive was was learning how to be a chameleon around people that um, weren't like me. I was the kid at school that I could go to any table in the lunchroom and I could sit at any table in the lunchroom and fit in. Mm. Not because that was authentically me, but because I learned how to be a chameleon in a dangerous environment for a young gay kid. And so that was, that's how I learned to be in the world. And then as a young adult, I go to school, I graduate, I move to Austin for graduate school, and I start being around other people that are experiencing the world in different ways, that are expressing themselves in different ways, that are having a totally different experience of love and commitment and joy and happiness and friendship. And I'm going, what is this? <laughs> what is going on? I didn't understand any of it. Available. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't get any of that. And, and so I feel like before I could be begin to heal, I was extremely, Melissa, I was extremely messy. I mean, I just went out in my life and I created an absolute mess, a mess personally, professionally, socially, financially, uh, all of it. I created an enormous mess. And only when that mess got really bad did, uh, and I, I sort of rolled around and rock bottom, I, I found myself 
in in bed for about six months uh, with a severe depression where I, I was absolutely unable to get out of bed for about 23 hours of any day. Hmm. And only then did I really go, I'm either going to check out of life or I'm going to figure this out and go all the way in. And that decision point, which my book is called Break and Untangle, and that break is making the decision to break away from that past, break away from the hurt as much as one can, and decide to untangle everything that you've been through, work through it, do the hard work, and keep moving forward. And that's what I decided to do. I'm glad you chose that. Me too. Me too. You have a section in your book titled, Pick Your Own Journey to God. Mm -hmm. And you have a quote by uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. Mm -hmm. I love that quote. Me too. What does that quote mean to you? Well, like I mentioned to you before, I, I felt like the pathway to God that had been laid out for me was one that I, I described as perverted. I, in my book, I call it spiritual terrorism. I think that our spirit, the, those parts of the human experience that are difficult to put into words, that often aren't able to be put into words, the spiritual experiences that are internal expressions of and, and feelings of joy and happiness and freedom and those spiritual ex experiences that are outside of us, like enjoying looking at the stars or going to the beach or experiencing the, the natural wonders of what this human experience allows for us. I had completely shut that off mm -hmm. because of what I had experienced as a kid spirituality specifically and, and religion, and I understand the distinction between the two, but for me, those have been intertwined as if there was no distinction. And the pathway to our spirituality became more important than spirituality itself. The methodology, the, the doing it properly was more important than what it actually meant. I can remember I was baptized as a, as a little kid. I think I was 12. And uh, I was baptized in a stock tank. And for, the, for, your, for your listeners that didn't grow up in rural America know what a stock tank is. It's this giant metal bowl that you put out for your livestock. And that's how they drink their water. My dad thought it would be a good idea to have one of those as a swimming pool in the backyard. And it was also sufficient for me to be baptized in. And I can remember when I was baptized, um, the, the preacher took my head and held my nose and dunked me underwater and lifted me back up. And everyone kind of freaked out because my feet had gone above water when my head was below water. And so there was this big ordeal. How do we fix this? And so my dad held my legs down. And then the preacher dunked me under the water again. And instead of the emphasis being on what the ceremony of the baptism meant, the washing away of the sins, the death of the old and the resurrection of the new, the emphasis was all on the proper and the mechanics of it. And I felt like there was sort of that, again, this sort of perverted view of what it all means, what our spirituality means and our obsession with doing it right. And my way is right and your way is wrong. Then the emphasis on that, which is meaningful. And so as I, I grew up, and I basically ignored this spiritual part of myself wholesale. I just discovered, like, I, I felt malnourished. I felt like there was a part of me that I wasn't in touch with that was incomplete, that needed, I needed some soul food, Melissa. I needed to, I needed to be able to feel again mm -hmm. and, and experience that side of myself. And, and so... That's what it meant for me. You, I don't think that we can detach the human experience from the spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. I, I think that it's just as important as, you know, having eyes or, or arms. Or it, it's just part of who we are and this human experience. So that's, that's what that meant to me. 
Okay, Chad, you're in dangerous territory here because I'm about to start preaching on Let's the it, integration girl. of body, mind, and spirit. Do it, do it. Day, all night, we can go, go on that topic. <laughs> also, I baptized my son in a stock tank. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it works. It does. And, you know, as you were going through the uh, ins and outs of it being, quote unquote, properly done, it dawned on me that humanity has a long history of taking a good idea and a good intention and legalizing it to the point that it's no longer recognizable. Yeah. And that happens in religion. That happens in about every aspect of life that we have. Yeah. And it's once yeah. that we prioritize the form over the meaning, I think that's a good red flag that we need to stop and look at what we're doing. I absolutely agree. I, I just think it misses the point. I can also remember, and I think it's a way that we, we, it's a way of reinforcing the tribe. Like, right. Mm -hmm. So like our, our tribe does it this way and our tribe is right. And the way that our tribe is right is we do it a certain way. I can remember doing, uh, taking the Lord's Supper. And I can remember distinctly as a kid, how much emphasis was put on grape juice or wine or leavened bread or unleavened bread. And there was so much more emphasis on the right way of doing it than there was what that stuff meant, what it meant to, to stand there mm -hmm. with that group of people and go through this ritual or this ceremony and what it signified. And I just find that to be sad. <laughs> yeah, I'm there with you. I'm yeah. there with you. Tell us about the other side of comfort. Well, the other side of comfort is um, a lot of discomfort. It's a lot of a lot of the work that I think we have to do to go through uh, a healing process. Um, and I think a lot of people, especially now, Melissa, are are doing this work sort of unintentionally as a result of going through a pandemic and experiencing mm -hmm. COVID and the the sort of having to come face to face with who we are absent the distractions that we were able to have pre-pandemic when we, when those distractions allowed us to avoid really looking at ourselves. And the other side of comfort is, is doing that very, very necessary work of examining ourselves and what we're about and what we want out of this life and, and, and being free to create the life that we want, free from the past and free to create that which we want. And as painful and as um, unpleasant as doing the work is, it has paid off e extraordinarily uh, for me. Part of the healing process also for me, going back to one of your earlier questions, was meeting my husband. And when I was in bed for six months, able to move, it, it was very much him that helped me through it. And, um, and that was new for me as well. The other side of comfort was realizing that other people can help us become whole. I, I grew up in an environment and I think our culture as a whole has sort of this pick yourself up by the bootstraps and do it on your own and make your own way. And this fiercely independent streak that we as Americans especially have is antithetical to the human experience. I, I think that we are social creatures. We need one another. And, and I, I don't think it diminishes the work that I've done on myself or anybody does on themselves when they say somebody else played a really key part and um, helped me become more of who I am and in many ways saved my life. And, and so the other side of comfort was getting to a, uh, experiencing love, experiencing love in a whole new way. Unconditional love can heal. Yeah. You know, it's, we look for the meaning of life. We go to so much trouble and expense and difficulty to find it, but it's always such a simple message. All we need is to be loved as who we are. Mm. Now, if you're hurting people, stop doing that. 
But if you're hurting people, it's probably because there's something broken or hurting inside of you. And if you have the space that someone allows where you can be loved as that broken, hurt person, and just the space to talk about your experience, that can change a life. That can change a life. If you want to change the world, go love people around you in your life. Mother Teresa said, if you want to change the world, go home and love your family. Those people closest to you, if you can love them unconditionally, and if you can love your family unconditionally, then believe me, loving a stranger is not a problem. That's right. But the people in your space, love them and give them space to be. And it's amazing what can come from that. Well, I mean, that would require us to... um not judge them mm -hmm. and not have so many expectations of them. And I find that really, really hard. It um, is. I'm, I'm curious about in your work, like how, how does this show up? How, how did you end up choosing a life of service through faith as a way of helping others? I was happy being a biologist. I was happy teaching high school. And a God helicopter repair per mechanic. Like I I was. I was I in mean, the National Guard for 10 years as a helicopter mechanic because, you know, why not? That's a whole other as story. As one does. Yeah. Yeah. As one does. Yeah. As one does. And uh, I, this is a whole long story. I'm trying to cut it way, way down. But it was not my idea to go into ministry. I thought it was a bad idea. I did not want to. People kept bringing it up. Uh, God kept pushing it. Finally, I realized, okay, that's what the future is going to be. I need a year to get on board because I'm not there now. Yeah. And ultimately, I worked my way there. During the pandemic, what I realized is when the pandemic came, I was right there at 20 years in ministry in this location, 19 years here and three years at a church that I served in seminary. The big awakening I had was, you know, I do a good job of preaching. I do a good job of teaching the Bible. I do a really good job of giving people access to God through the Bible, through preaching and those experiences. What I hadn't been doing was sharing the tools that I had used to grow as a human being. You know, we tell people to go and pray, but we don't often give them the tools to know how they can do that in a way that's meaningful and effectual for them. Yeah. So that's what I made a commitment to doing is to start sharing the tools of how, how we do these things, how we connect with God. And a lot of that is understanding ourselves a lot better. It's underneath all of those layers of our self and our accomplishments and our ego and our constructs of this world that we encounter that still small voice and getting there, that can be hard, but it's why, why did you choose? Me. Why did you choose um, religion over philosophy or being a therapist or what, what was it about that path that you thought this is how I can best serve? I don't think there's a big distinction. I think mm -hmm. they just ask different questions. Mm -hmm. The best way I can illustrate this is in the village I live, about 16, 17 years ago, there was an explosion in the chemical plant right on the edge of town. It was a big, huge catastrophe for us. And when people ask, Kids in junior high would come up to me, how can I handle evolution with what I learn about faith and so yeah, forth? And the, yeah. the image I use is, okay, you remember when the plant exploded? If there was a physicist and a poet that both witnessed that event and they wrote about it, would their writings be the same? No, of course not. Does that mean one of them got it wrong? No, of course not. Mm -hmm. Science is a way of understanding how things work, how they are related, how they go together. Spirituality and faith is a why. Why are we here? Why 
um, how can we find meaning in all of it? As you said, we are embodied spirits in this mm. experience. And to be an embodied spirit is to have form and function. We can't express ourselves without our bodies. We need our voices. We need our hands or our bodies to give expression to our deepest thoughts and emotions. And that's how this created world works. Mm -hmm. So understanding that to me is understanding God at a better level, at a different level. They're all part of the same understanding to me. So to say I serve God in, or I serve the world through religion instead of through science, it doesn't really ring with me because I do both. Mm -hmm. It's that faith-seeking understanding is a definition of theology. And to me, understanding how we can learn about a tree through the different rings in it, we can learn how old it is, we can learn about seasons of drought and seasons of flood just by looking at the rings of the tree. That speaks volumes to me about who I call God. Some people might use a different term or a different name or spirit or higher power. To me, I use the word God, but all of that to me points me toward that higher power. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was really fascinating as I was learning more about you that a biologist can become a, a pastor. And, and there, I mean, there are, there are so many contradictions that exist in, in that, that pairing. And I just thought it would be fascinating to hear you talk about how you resolve that and, and reconcile that. And it, it, if I'm hearing you right, I'm hearing that there's, that we can talk about the why and we can talk about the how of the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's just a different way. It's, it's a different standpoint from which we're looking at it. If, if you and I were both looking at a dog and one of us was speaking Spanish and one speaking English, the, the words would sound very, very different, but it's the same dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I just, I wanted to know from you and hear from you what, how, how you reconcile that. I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. Yeah. To me, there's people, not yeah. a, a chasm to be reconciled. Mm. To me, it's all the same reality. I read uh, Genesis to me as a call and response story. Evolution to me is a call and response story. It's God speaking to creation and creation responding. And this is an ongoing, ever going conversation. Mm. How, how do you, though, look at how do you respond to people who take that literally, though? I invite them to consider uh, that very real experience that we had when the chemical plant exploded or any other phenomenon. People come at it from a different place, but that doesn't mean they're wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think the beginning is to understand that a paradox doesn't mean flaw or problem. Mm -hmm. Paradox just means another pathway, another way to understand. So that, that makes me think about the climate that we live in today, where so many people don't understand me or people that are in some way other than the norm. How, how do you spread that message? How do you amplify your voice saying there is no real paradox of our human experience? We are all human beings having a different experience through different lenses, through different frames through a lot of paradox, like how, how do we amplify that? I think the key is relationship. We can hold a lot of ideas in our minds, but when we have real relationships with real people, a lot of those differences fall away. Mm. We see the other as a whole lot like ourselves. Yeah. In the scholarly sense or the headspace sense, uh, you know, check out the bonus episode. I'm going to go in depth. I went in depth in that one on how the Bible speaks to that inclusivity. I want to say this here. If we want to find rationale to support slavery, we can find it in the Bible. Hmm. If we want to find rationale to abolish slavery, we can find that in the Bible. If we're looking for rationale to love and include all people, we can find that in the Bible. If we want to find verses and rationale to exclude people, 
We can find that in the Bible. Whenever you go looking for something, you can find a verse, you can pull it out of context and support whatever view you have. But when you look at the context and the message over and over and over again, it's a story of human expectations that God flips upside down to include, to redeem, and to love. But I go more in detail about that in the bonus episode. But don't you think that that, for me, I find that really refreshing because it puts a lot of, I guess, free will back on us about the decision that we get to make about who we want to be. Do we, do we want to search out the scripture that excludes or do we want to search out the scripture that includes? And that's a choice that, that we get to make. And I, mm-hmm. I, for me, I find that refreshing. I, I, I like that. Yeah. And a lot of people are going to choose differently than we do. And yeah. that's the nature of the world. But I think that, you know, in this age of such divisive politics and for context, we're filming this two days after midterm elections. So there's a lot of divisiveness in our culture right now that's been expressed politically and rhetorically. But in the midst of all of that, I think if we genuinely sit with people and listen not to rebut and not to respond, but genuinely listen to where another person is coming from, and we have outliers, of course, I'm not speaking to all exceptions, but generally people are coming from a place of good intention, at least. Mm -hmm. Not always. Some people are very blatant about, I do not see you as a full human being. That happens in a lot of different ways. That happens in heterosexuality and homosexuality. That happens in cases of abuse. I can beat on you. I can diminish you because I don't feel you're fully human and worthy of my love and respect. That happens in a lot of different manifestations. But again, I think that also comes from a place of hurt and brokenness. I don't believe God creates monsters. I think human beings are really good at creating monsters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my dad beat me and I have, you know, scars on my back to to prove it. He beat me because his dad beat him and his dad beat him and his dad beat him. And and you're right. Like we have done a really good job of creating monsters. We 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 are really really good at that. But, you know, that's that was one of the reasons that I, I wanted to write my book was was this idea of breaking and untangling and making a different decision. We can, in those moments of feeling different and other and at our lowest, make it as evaluate what what it, how did I get here? How, how did I end up here? And am I the beneficiary of generations of trauma and abuse and ignorance? And my answer was yes. And and I had to make a conscious decision in that moment to stop living a life of default and just doing it the way it had always been done, Uh, sort of creating a monster by uh, a a lineage of monsters and just making the decision that that's just not going to be who I am, that it will stop with me. And that's the key. When we heal ourselves, we don't pass down that pain and that brokenness to the next generation. Mm -hmm. When we heal ourselves, we pass along a different pattern. And then, you know, do some math, multiply that out a little bit and see the difference that that's going to make. That's profound. It is profound. Yeah, I loved what you were saying earlier about, and it's something that I say in my teaching a lot, we have to get out of ourselves. There does come a place in, in, our healing process. I don't know that I was able to recognize it when I was going through the the mud of it all, but certainly when I started making a little bit of progress, realizing how much intellectualizing and how much of a circle I was going in in my own head about my own stuff. Hmm. And, when, and when I realized sort of, I guess, healing 2.0 was getting out of self and getting into service. It's not just enough for me to be okay. And that's, and, and, and the sort of the crazy thing about it is that it's not just that it helps other people 
it is our own next step. Like the, mm-hmm. the our our next level of development is the service part of it. And yes, other people benefit from that. But I, I do think that we reach a plateau, a level where you get stinted in your growth if you're not expressing that and exercising that and helping other people grow. And and so I, I just wanted to harken back to that comment that you made earlier and let you know how much I related to that and how much I think that deserves uh, and a little bit of an anchor of of getting out of yourself, getting into service, being there for other people, because that is what we need. There was an episode of Friends, and this is my absolute favorite episode. I don't know if you watched the show or if anyone listening watched the show, but there's an episode where Phoebe and Joey had this debate about service and about helping others. And I think it was Phoebe who said, there's no such thing as a selfless act, Mm -hmm. that you always benefit from it. And she was frustrated by it. And I thought that was the most beautiful thing about this world, that there is no such thing as a selfless act. Yeah. When we serve others, when we give, just like you said, it grows us, it benefits us. Yeah. I was reading about you know, the idea, some of the ideas behind Buddhism and Zen this morning and this idea of, of the one and, and the one is, is also the many and, and how like there's just this circle of one and many and how it really can't be distinguished mm-hmm. and, and just how beautiful of a thought that is of, of exactly what you're talking about. Chad, how much has gratitude played a role in your healing and in your life and in your career now? That's a really interesting question. I'm glad that you brought this up because it's going to give me a chance to talk about it and maybe do some processing here with you, Melissa. So I, I, uh, my past life, I was um, director of marketing for the world's largest real estate company. And I was, I found myself pretty unfulfilled with that work. It was good for the bank account, not so good for the soul. And, and now I've transitioned into doing that in a different way, uh, doing the, the coaching curriculum development and writing and, and doing what I can to help other people. But I have really struggled in the transition. I have really struggled coming out of that old self and into the new. I, I have found in myself that my old self is fighting for survival and <laughs> the new self is also fighting to be born. And a lot of what results from that is this sort of paralysis and being stuck and mm-hmm. unable to move when you have two forces pulling you in two directions, forward progress just isn't possible. And I, I was telling my husband this the other day, I said, I think I'm going to go to a beach on some random Tuesday and I'm going to have a funeral for my old self. I'm going to write out all of those parts of myself that just need to die off all of those old ideas about who I am or who I was, and they just need to go away. And so I was ruminating on this idea of funeral for myself. And I was planning like, which beach am I going to go to? Where can I start a fire in California on the beach? (laughs) And, and what I, all of my ruminating and journaling on this just a, just a few days ago, I realized that it's not just a funeral that I want to have. I want to have a celebration of that life. Like the best funerals are celebrations of life. And I have not done a whole lot of gratitude and celebrating what that old version of me did and accomplished and worked on and went through. I've not done enough to show enough gratitude to myself to acknowledge and celebrate the work that I've done and not just me, but the people that have helped me along the way and the people that have played such an important role. And, and so to answer your question directly, what role has gratitude played? Not enough, absolutely not enough. And I am searching for ways right now to manifest that gratitude in ways that that makes sense for where I am in this season of my life. I think that that's what's necessary right now is to celebrate and show some gratitude for what I, what I did. Um, because there was this idea in, in my transition, 
to what I'm doing now career-wise and, and a lot of personal stuff. Where I looked back on, on, you know, who I was five years ago with some resentment and regret. And I don't know that that's healthy. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that that's what is necessary right now because that old self also learned a whole lot, also helped a lot of people in ways that I, I'm not doing now, but helped people and made a difference and made an impact. And I'm not, I don't, I don't know if it's worth just beating up on that guy all the time so that the new one can emerge. And so, Melissa, I want to show more gratitude um, for that old self specifically right now. So that's where my head is around gratitude right now. Chad, when I was on a forgiveness journey, forgiveness is one of my huge preaching points. I'm going to not go there at the moment again. It, but it's so fascinating, though. I, it will yeah, change we'll our to... lives physically, mentally, yeah. emotionally, spiritually. But yeah. When I was on that journey for myself, uh, I realized I was holding on to some things. You know, we each have that bit about ourselves that we never want another human being to know. Yeah. And I was confronting those things within myself. And I was doing it with the help of a trusted colleague. And I said it out loud. And that was terrifying, but also freeing. And we talked about it. And he said, have you ever thanked that young woman, because she didn't have the tools you have now. Yeah. And she got you through so that you could be this person today. And that blew my mind. Yeah. And when I took time to do that, I felt a physical lightness after that. Gratitude is so powerful. Yeah. And I, 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 I really love that story because, and when we talk about gratitude, I don't know that we, we put enough attention on gratitude for ourselves. Yeah. There's like gratitude for other people, gratitude for material things. But I think you just made a really, really good point. You know, gratitude, not, not just forgiveness, but also gratitude for our own journey and our own past self, who, who we were in, in, the, in our process of becoming and along our journey. I love that. Yeah. And when you bury that guy on the beach, by the way, if you need an officiant, let me know. I do a <laughs> fantastic funeral service, but don't forget to thank him for getting you through yeah. a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I that. Chad, I have a hundred more questions I'd love to ask you. Maybe we can do this again sometime. That would be great. As we close, I want to give you the last word and an opportunity here. What are your best words, your best thoughts, your best wishes for someone going through something that seems unsurvivable at the moment? Yeah. I think that part, one of the things that I learned on my journey was just how much suffering there is to lie. And I think that there is an important distinction, at least for me and where I am right now, that if life is about suffering, then I get to make a choice if I'm going to suffer from or if I'm going to suffer toward. Mm. I get a choice about living in the past and choosing to suffer from what my dad did to me, suffering from what I went through with an ex, suffering from the mistakes that I made. Or I can decide to create the life that I want and suffer toward creating that life. And that completely reframes how you look at life. You're either suffering from or you're suffering toward. And what I hope for anybody listening is that if you're going to suffer, that you choose to suffer toward. Thank you, Chad. Thank you.